In today's video, we'll be discussing 10 MSK radiology cases. This is your first case. If you're new here, my name is Dr. Amar Dare. I am the founder of the radiology teaching website, radiogyan.com. Uh, I am a clinical assistant professor at the University of Calgary, uh, Alberta, Canada. And we do these sessions every Saturday, so you can tune in around the same time, so 8 p.m. India time and 9.30 or 10.30 Eastern, depending on where you're attending this from. So how this works is I'll show you a few cases, uh, and then we'll discuss uh, a few important pearls in regard to that, in, the, in regard to those cases. So this is your first case. In today's video, uh, we'll be uh, discussing a few MSK cases, and these will help you prepare for your radiology board exams. These can be your uh, MD, DNB, FRCR, or other board exams. So I'll show you a case, and you guys can let me know the answer in the chat section. We discussed bone tumors uh, in our previous lecture in detail, so there will be some overlap. So I'd uh, request, uh, if you're watching this for the first time, pause this video. Uh, for those watching later, uh, pause this video, watch the first video, and then watch this one. Okay, so we have radiographs of the uh, uh, of the right uh, uh, knee joint. This patient was uh, a 20-year-old uh, uh, boy who was presenting with knee pain. So what are your thoughts about this one? Let me know in the chat what uh, uh, your thoughts are. So let's start with the, uh, where the pathology is. So let's try to localize the pathology. So where do you think the pathology is? Is it in the femur? Is it in the tibia? Or is it in the uh, fibula? Chondroblastoma is a good thought. And we'll discuss why this is not a chondroblastoma. Ewing sarcoma, that's a good differential. A few cases today have MRI images, so uh, uh, they, some, some cases are difficult to diagnose just on radiographs, so uh, MR will help in those cases. So let's start here with the, where the pathology is. So you see there's this ill-defined lesion involving the proximal tibia reaching up to the <clears throat> articular surface. Uh, there's no definite cortical breach as such. And uh, there's no matrix uh, calcification. So the lesion involves the epiphysis in a adult patient. So uh, epiphyseal lesions, there are very few epiphyseal lesions that we discussed previously, how it's easier to remember those few epiphyseal lesions. Uh, so the epiphyseal lesions, the, the two main ones, uh, which are bone tumors, are chondroblastoma and uh, giant cell tumor. So don't... Uh, uh, call uh, the chondroblastoma uh, in a patients with fused skeleton. So chondroblastoma is commonly seen in patients in uh, uh, when the epiphysis is uh, not fused. So younger patients will have chondroblastoma as epiphyseal lesions, whereas uh, in patients with fused epiphysis, the diagnosis should be giant cell tumor. Uh, a few of you have rightly pointed out in the chat as GCT, but I'd request you please, please do not use short forms in your exam. GCT can mean germ cell tumor as well. And there has been, uh, I have uh, myself committed this uh, mistake in an exam uh, uh, when I was uh, shown a case and uh, during like, it was, uh, it was a VIVA and they asked me what's the answer and said, I said GCT. And then I was trying to uh, come up with the full form and I said germ cell tumor by mistake. So get into the habit of using full uh, full forms. I, I've reiterated, I've said this multiple times, but just reiterating. So this was a giant cell tumor. So giant cell tumors are locally aggressive tumors. Less than 10% uh, are malignant, but radiology cannot distinguish between a benign and a malignant uh, giant cell tumor. Uh, they are formed from non-bone forming supportive connective tissues, and uh, there'll be a proliferation of osteoclasts. osteoclasts. Uh, the typical age group is 20 to 40 years, and the imaging appearance, as we saw in our case, is uh, uh, eccentric subarticular lesion. These usually begin at the metaphysis, but then uh, they grow towards the uh, epiphysis and reaching up to the subarticular surface. There are very few bone lesions that will reach up to the subarticular uh, 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 surface of bone. So uh, GCT would be one of them. 
Uh, the other differential for a subarticular region, say in an elderly patient uh, with a sclerotic margin, would be a geode. So uh, these patients undergo uh, degenerative changes, and in the subarticular bone, you may see uh, uh, a geode. But uh, in those cases, you'll see advanced degenerative changes on either side of the knee joint. So remember, if you have an eccentric subarticular lesion, giant cell tumor should be your main differential. Uh, and as I was saying, 10% are uh, less than 10% are malignant. So the term used for such tumors is quasi malignant. So, and finally, they can have a soap bubble pattern. These become expensile and there's reactive bone formation uh, with trabeculations. So, that gives rise to this multi loculated uh, 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 soap bubble kind of appearance where there are thin internal septations. But these are not true septations. This is just reactive uh, bone trabeculate. So, that was giant cell tumor. Uh, Ewing's would, I would keep Ewing's restricted for a differential for a diaphyseal lesion, especially if I only have a, a radiograph. Somebody else says fibrous dysplasia, fibrous dysplasia, that's a good thought, but they're more usually diaphyseal uh, uh, lesions. So I would not give fibrous dysplasia as the top differential here. We revise this again. Uh, this is an excellent. Uh, uh, illustration by Max Klansky, uh, which shows all different types of bone tumors, where they occur and what's their typical imaging appearance. We discussed this in detail previously. And the other thing while, re while reporting bone tumors is uh, the age of the patient. That's very important. So two important things, age of the patient, the location of the tumor uh, when you're reporting bone tumors. And as we discussed last time, if you're reporting an MRI for the bone, MRI for bone tumors for a patient, please make sure that you uh, get radiographs because some benign lesions can appear aggressive on MRI. So one example of that would be fibrous dysplasia, especially if it's in the head and neck, it can really have an aggressive appearance, uh, whereas say a CT or radiograph would be diagnostic with that ground glass kind of appearance. Okay, moving on to the next case. This is a slightly tougher one. Let's start with the, uh, the pathology here. Like, where do you think the pathology is? And then I, for this patient, we have MR. So I'll show you the MR next. So non-ossifying fibroma, Preeti, that's a good thought. But like, again, uh, I would not say that's a good thought. It's mostly cortical-based. So this lesion uh, was eccentric, but it was not cortical-based. So non-ossifying fibroma uh, uh, or fibrous cortical defect, they would be more uh, cortical-based. So I would not give this as a differential. So let's uh, look at this uh, pelvis radiograph. A relatively younger patient, you can identify. So whenever you get a bone radiograph, look at the uh, the, the ossification centers. You see, uh, uh, looking at the radiograph, you can tell that this is a slightly younger patient. Now let's uh, try to identify where the pathology is. Uh, so Ivan, excellent. You've rightly pointed out. There's this large lytic lesion uh, centered around the left iliac bone. And uh, I should have given you the complete radiograph for comparison, but uh, 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 does like I hope you appreciate that there's associated adjacent soft tissue swelling. Uh, the iliacus uh, muscle is usually isn't the muscles around the, uh, the the iliac bone here usually aren't that bulky. So left iliac wing, everybody has rightly pointed out the lesion. Let's look at the MR now. So we have uh, the corresponding MR for this patient. So from the radiograph, we know that this is an aggressive lesion. And the way that we distinguish um, it, the most important thing is to look at the zone of transition. So the zone of transition is the distinct, uh, the, the margin between abnormal bone and uh, normal bone. If you can draw the line between these uh, with a pencil or a pen, uh, that's known as a narrow zone of transition. And if you can't, then it's a wide zone of transition. Benign tumors typically have narrow zones of transition and malignant tumors have wide zones of transition. So for example, here, I don't know where the tumor ends and where the normal bone starts. This is a wide zone of transition. And remember that this, uh, the, the zone of transition is used only for MRI, uh, only for uh, radiographs. Don't use it for MRI, because MRI obviously will show you more, uh, 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 more pathology than X-rays. And then MR will also show you peritumoral edema, which is difficult to dif uh, uh, differing from normal bone. So zone of transition, and the zone of transition in most cases will be narrow on MR in all cases. So don't use zone of transition for MR. 
Okay, so Ewing's fibrous dysplasia, that's again a good thought here, but fibrous dysplasia, uh, Abdi will not have this kind of expense, uh, this kind of extensive extraceous soft tissue. Fibrous dysplasia would be uh, confined to the bone. Uh, so that's definitely not a differential here. Uh, Nuthan, again, yeah, fibrous dysplasia would not be a differential here. Uh, Manish, Mohammed uh, rightly pointed out, this uh, is an Ewing sarcoma. So remember we discussed last time, uh, bone tumors, when they're aggressive and there's, there's, there's soft, soft tissue, there's very, it's challenging to distinguish uh, uh, in between like the, 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 the particular histopathology. So a few clues that can help you to diagnose uh, um, aggressive bone tumors into their subclass, like which pathology is it, is uh, say, look at the matrix. So if there is a... Uh, if there is a matrix, uh, if there is a calcified matrix, uh, then it would be an osteogenic sarcoma. Here, I don't see a calcified matrix. I see some calcifications along the uh, iliac crest here, uh, but they're not convincing for matrix calcification. So definitely not an osteogenic sarcoma. Secondly, we talked about Ewing sarcoma last time. The characteristic would be uh, a bone tumor uh, whose the, the bone involvement is small, but there is Extra the, the extraction of tissue is extensive. So in this case, that fits. Other differential in a pediatric patient can be METS. Uh, neuroblastoma is the common culprit, but those you'll see uh, uh, extensive periosteal reaction, which you don't see in this case. So putting all this together, this is an aggressive bone tumor, which will obviously need a biopsy for histopathology. But if I had to pick one, I would pick Ewing sarcoma, as uh, all of you have rightly pointed out. Chondrosarcoma, will have more rings and arcs type of calcification and that chondroid matrix. We don't see that uh, as much here. So I would put that lower down. And uh, chondrosarcoma to reach, uh, have this kind of extensive extra of soft tissue, that would be rare. Before that, you'll see those ring and arc type of calcification. Plasma cytoma, again, that would be seen in older uh, patients. So I would not put that here. So Ewing sarcoma, we discussed this last time, we'll go over it quickly. So most commonly, the diaphysis of bones are affected. Only bone tumor that can mimic an infection, if the patient can have fever, elevated ESR. Uh, this is falls into the category of round blue cell tumor. So very aggressive, rapidly growing tumors. Uh, and it's commonly metastatic. So very aggressive tumor. Uh, finally, uh, it can give rise to onion peel tile of lamellated periosteal reaction. Uh, treatment is surgical excision. And another important fact, which they may ask you in your OSCE exams or VIVA is this is the most common tumor that metastasizes to bone. Okay, next case here. So we have radiographs of uh, uh, the knee. This patient also we have a MR. So I can show you the MR. NOF, I don't see any ossification and uh, there's expansile. This is an expansile lesion. So I would put that lower down. Osteosarcoma given the location is a good thought, but uh, do you see chondroid matrix here? Okay, let's start with the, the, the uh, let me know if this is a benign or a malignant, uh, or, okay, we should not be using benign and malignant, uh, the term on radiographs, the preferred term is aggressive and non-aggressive because infection is a benign condition, but it can have an aggressive appearance. So is this an aggressive or a non-aggressive lesion? Let's start with that. So we know that this lesion is affecting the distal uh, femur, uh, the metaphysis uh, predominantly. So uh, osteosarcoma, let's talk about, it's okay. So Ivan is saying aggressive, Preeti and Anshuman are saying non-aggressive. So let's look at the, uh, the, the zone of transition. So the zone of transition is quite narrow. I can distinguish the normal and abnormal bone, but at the same time, there is some cortical, uh, uh, there's some periosteal reaction here, uh, but the zone of transition should be your major criteria while putting this in. So I would say, this is a non-aggressive tumor. Uh, so with non-aggressive expansile eccentric tumor involving the metaphysis, what would be your thoughts now? <clears throat> so yeah, agree that, glad that most of you think this is non-aggressive.
chondromic sort fibroma it's a good thought i'll show you the mr and then uh, maybe that will help with the so non ossifying fibroma again i would expect uh, more uh, it'd be more dense than this it ca it causing expensile uh, an eccentric lytic lesion the chances of that would be less maybe on the uh, sagittal it does appear a bit sclerotic but with the mr i think it should be easier now So the MR shows uh, an expensile lesion with multiple fluid fluid levels. <clears throat> and as all, um, all of you have rightly pointed out, this is an aneurysmal bone cyst. So aneurysmal bone cysts, uh, interestingly, are the only bone tumors that are named after their radiological appearance. Say, for example, a giant cell tumor is based on a histopathology, osteogenic sarcoma, again, histopathology, Ewing sarcoma, again, histopathology, simple bone cyst, again, it's histopathology. So aneurysmal bone cyst is the only bone tumor that is named after its radiological appearance. Uh, initially, these were classified as simple bone cysts, but later Jaffe found out that, no, these are different from simple bone cysts, and he termed the he coined the term aneurysmal bone cyst based on uh, their, their radiological appearance. Interestingly, uh, both its terms are misnomers, so it's not, aneur uh, it's not an aneurysm, it's, it's a bone lesion, and these are not true cysts. These are blood-filled uh, uh, cavities uh, separated by septation, so these are not true cysts. So that's uh, an interesting fact about aneurysmal bone tumor. Um, commonly, the age group is 5 to 20 years. And, and we discussed that GCTs are more than 20 years. So remember that don't uh, call uh, a GCT in a patient less than uh, when there's no epiphyseal fusion. So um, again, as I said, uh, ABCs are the only tumor that can cross the epiphyseal plate. Uh, very few uh, bone tumors uh, do that, and ABC is one of them. There can be marked ballooning. Uh, again, uh, uh, this is one of the common differential for expensile lytic bone lesions, and this can give rise to uh, uh, a balloon, a finger in a balloon appearance because the bone itself uh, is the finger and the expanded portion, the tumor, is the balloon. Uh, the other term used for this is blown out appearance. Now, finally, another interesting sign that can be seen in ABC because these are so slow growing lesions, there'll be thickening of the, there'll be periosteal reaction uh, at its margins, which is known as periosteal, periosteal buttressing. And that's characteristic for ABCs. Any slow growing tumors can give rise to that, but it's commonly seen with aneurysmal bones. ABCs, yeah. So, so Saharish, uh, ABCs do not have periosteal reaction, but if it goes beyond the, uh, the, the, the confines of the bone, uh, then they can have periosteal buttressing. Okay, moving on to the next case. So this is a knee radiograph and looking at the epiphysis, they're not completely fused yet. You can see some, uh, uh, the epiphyseal line, uh, uh, the fascial line still. So this is again, a pediatric patient. So any time you get a chest uh, radiograph, I can't stress this enough, first try to age the patient. So this is a young patient. Now let's try to find where the pathology is. And yeah, these can be very challenging just on radiograph and just because they are, uh, the, the imaging appearance overlaps and then a few of these are not very, very typical cases. The, the point here is that that's how you are gonna get cases in real life and we want to simulate that, uh, especially with bone tumors. Okay, so let's try to again, start with localizing the pathology. Uh, so where is the pathology in this case? I have the MR for this patient and then uh, that will help. Fibrous cortical defect, I think that's the favorite diagnosis uh, for a lot of people. Okay, so um, Preeti says metaphysis of femur. Um, on the lateral radiograph, the metaphys metaphysis looks really clean. So. Uh, and I know the answer, so that's why it's not the metaphysis of femur. That leaves us with the proximal tibia and uh, a few of you, Rajat, Tayabba and Upasana have rightly pointed out. So proximal tibial metaphysis, so tibial femur, yeah. So proximal tibial metaphysis, you see there is this ill-defined lesion here uh, with sclerotic margins. Uh, it may be difficult, especially if you're watching on uh, your mobile devices. 
So uh, unfortunately, I don't think I can zoom in here, but uh, look at this area. It appears a bit more sclerotic than the rest of the femur. So let's compare the medial tibia, medial femoral uh, medial femoral condyle to the tibial condyle. You see this ill-defined sclerotic area uh, with poor margins. So that's the pathology. And uh, because the zone of transition is wide, I'm thinking I'm worried about an aggressive lesion here. Okay, so not very visible. I, uh, I, as I said, especially if you're watching on your mobile devices, it may be challenging. If you can later zoom in the video and then check it out, the, the, the MR is more convincing. So now if you have with the MR, what would you think of? In a young patient in aggressive, uh, uh, a, zone, a lesion with wide zone of transition. So young patient, aggressive lesion with some areas of matrix calcification. So Anshuman says telangiectatic OGS. So I, I got these answers even in the previous class, a few of you said telangiectatic or osteogenic sarcoma. That is a very rare tumor. And the, the, the one thing that it has to have is, so telangiectasia uh, should like, it, 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 whenever you hear that word, that means uh, uh, that there is a tangle of something. So uh, Osteogenic, uh, telangiectatic osteogenic sarcoma will have an expensile, markedly expensile appearance. Uh, it'll be lobulated, there'll be multiple septations. So, unless you get that kind of appearance, uh, I would not put osteogenic telangiectatic osteosarcoma in the differential. So, be careful uh, with uh, putting it there because you may uh, land up yourself in trouble because that's not a very common differential. And then the Y1 will go uh, towards that. and because it's not very common, you, you may not read more, more about it, you'll find yourself in trouble. So this was an osteogenic sarcoma. Uh, again, it's very challenging to identify here, but uh, if you're looking at it on a larger device, you'd appreciate that there is um, this aggressive lesion with uh, a, a calcific matrix involving the proximal tibia reaches up to the uh, knee joint here. So that's poor prognosis for the patient. We discussed this in detail last time. We can revise it quickly. It's the second most common tumor commonly seen in pediatric patients, uh, especially if it's de novo. Secondary osteogenic sarcoma is usually seen in older patients and uh, surface osteosarcoma, so the periosteal and parosteal osteosarcomas, they are seen in older patients, whereas uh, central osteogenic sarcoma that involves the, 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 the main bone, the central portion of the bone, so that's uh, common in the pediatric uh, age group. Uh, it's a permeative uh, destructive lesion. Uh, it can have various types of periosteal reactions. One of them is the cumulus cloud appearance because of the lobulated margins uh, that can give rise to that. The other appearance is Codman's triangle. So the, it, there is extraceous soft tissue which lifts the periosteum, which gives rise to Codman's triangle. The treatment is surgical excision. Interestingly, I don't know if the reason for that, if you know, let me know in the comments. Most bone tumors are centered around the knee joint. I don't know if it has to do with the weight, knee joint being the weight bearing joint, but uh, there's, they don't, they're not common around the pelvis, so that theory may not work. But uh, when you start reading these, most common locations for these bone tumors are around the knee. I don't know why. So this is a very characteristic location for a characteristic tumor. Infarct, uh, infarct would usually be seen as a medullary lesion. Uh, I don't appreciate a medullary lesion with serpiginous border. So that's how the infarct, how an infarct will look. So less likely. So I'll show you the CT. Okay, so good that a few of you have rightly identified the anomaly here. So the anomaly here is this ill-defined uh, lesion predominantly uh, best seen on the lateral and the frontal, it's not appreciated well, but on the lateral projection, there is this uh, sclerotic lesion along the posterior margin of the, uh, the femur, distal femur. Uh, we have radiographs and uh, we have CTs and MR for this patient. So, So that's right, Ivan, you've uh, rightly picked up the finding here. So 
surface osteosarcoma, that's correct. That's the umbrella term for tumors that occur on the surface of uh, bones. Central tumors are bo uh, the bones, uh, the tumors that affect uh, the main bone as such, and surface tumors are uh, tumors that affect the uh, adjacent, mm, the surface of bone. So they can be uh, periosteal, they can be parosteal, they can be osteosarcomas, they can be chondrosarcomas, uh, and they can also be lipomas. So th that's the spectrum of surface uh, bone tumors. Now let's look at this lesion. Uh, a few of you have said parosteal, a few of you have said periosteal. Uh, good that that's, this has come up so that we can discuss it. So the finding here is this uh, sclerotic lesion along the posterior margin of distal femur, a very characteristic location uh, for what is known as parosteal osteogenic sarcoma. Uh, so uh, I believe a, the, the, the more typical appearance is that you'll be seeing, because this arises from, uh, so whenever you, you hear the, pa the word para, that means it's adjacent to something. So for example, a parovarian cyst, so it's adjacent to the ovary. So parosteal uh, sarcoma would be adjacent to the bone. So it arises from um, the surface of the bone, so adjacent to it. So you usually have a cleft that separates the tumor from uh, the bone itself. But as the tumor grows, this cleft can uh, cleft or also known as the cleavage sign. So that can uh, disappear. So remember that you may, it's only seen in 30% of cases. So uh, the, the, it's not the only, like it's not a definitive way to distinguish a parosteal versus a periosteal. Uh, the, the more important, uh, uh, characteristic of periosteal osteosarcomas is that they are usually circumferential and they affect the diaphysis. So that's how you distinguish periosteal. So P-E-R-I, periosteal uh, osteogenic sarcomas from parosteal, P-A-R-O-S-T-E-L. So parosteals are usually focal and they are metaphysial. This is a very common location. So parosteal yeah, so string sign surface osteosarcoma may help. Surface osteosarcoma can also be uh, periosteal osteosarcoma is also a surface osteosarcoma. So just don't say surface osteosarcoma. Uh, specify that this is a parosteal osteosarcoma. So the, the, the cleavage plane is also known as a string sign because it looks like a string separating the tumor from the bone uh, uh, and is also known as the cleavage sign. What, uh, compared to central osteogenic sarcomas, as I told you before, these are effect, uh, these are seen in older patients and this grows very slowly. Uh, whereas the central osteogenic sarcomas, they are more aggressive and are seen in pediatric patients. Uh, posterior surface of the femur is a very typical location. Uh, the other important uh, differential uh, that you'll be commonly asked in your exams is how do you distinguish, distinguish this from myositis ossificans? Uh, myositis ossificans, Although in most cases would be easier to distinguish, it's not that close to bone, but sometimes it may be closer to uh, bone cortex and that it may be difficult to dif uh, differentiate. So remember, uh, uh, sarcomas, S for sarcomas and C for central. So they sound similar. So they centrally calcify and they're peripherally less dense, whereas myositis ossificans, uh, they are peripherally dense and they are centrally less dense. So the way I remember is sarcomas sound like, cent uh, sound like central. So the calcification in sarcomas is central. Periosteal, periosteal sarcoma, we discussed it. How will you distinguish that? So this one uh, is a slightly older patient and we have shoulder radiographs. So whenever you're reporting uh, x-rays, try to identify, try, try to get into the habit of uh, noticing the soft tissue, what's happening to the soft tissue around bones, because uh, many a times uh, they'll help you diagnose either a fracture or an underlying bone tumor. Uh, if you have, uh, if you have the left and right sides to compare, that's ideal. But in most cases, you won't have that. So try to observe and try to uh, look at both uh, soft tissues around each structure. Try to uh, especially when there's a, say, for example, there's a fracture. Try to look how the soft tissue uh, reacts to that. Say, for example, in the foot and around the ankle, that's a very tight space. So if there's a fracture and trauma, you'll often see soft tissue swelling. Whereas, uh, say, uh, around the hip joint, there's the, the soft tissue there is very lax. So you may or may not see soft tissue swelling easily around the hip joint, but around tighter spaces, say, around the fingers. Uh, so if you uh, sometimes a fracture may be 
very subtle. So if you just see soft tissue swelling, which is different from the other fingers, that may point uh, you towards uh, where the fracture is. So start looking at these soft tissues. Like for example, here, there is this large uh, uh, bone tumor, but look at the soft tissues. Uh, in the supraclavicular region, how bulky it is, uh, whereas compared to the other soft tissue around the arm. So uh, soft tissue can be like, that will give you a clue towards it, like pathology. So this one, all of you have got this one right. So we see this large uh, tumor with this ring and arc type of calcification. So now if you go back and look at the first case, that didn't have any time, uh, the, the one involving the ileum, that did have this kind of calcification. So that chondrosarcoma would not be a differential for that. So this one here, uh, with this, especially with this lobulated T2 hyperintense uh, appearance, that's very characteristic of chondrosarcomas. So chondrosarcomas are malignant uh, cartilage forming tumors. Age is very important for chondrosarcomas. The other sarcomas, Ewing's and osteogenic sarcomas, they are pediatric tumors. Again, um, the previous case was a younger patient and Preeti had rightly pointed out that the age doesn't match a chondrosarcoma. So older patient with calcified matrix with this kind of chondroid uh, ring and arc type of calcification, chondrosarcoma would be the main differential. Uh, Finally, the, 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 the calcification, there are various terms that have been used to describe this. There's popcorn, fluffy, cotton wool, rings and arcs is the, 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 the common one that used. The treatment for these cases is resection. These are very slow growing tumors, so they don't usually metastasize, so prognosis is usually good. Again, a very uh, challenging case uh, on radiograph. The history helps, obviously, but let's first try to localize the tumor. So where is the tumor? Is it, it Does it involve the right denominate bone, the left denominate bone, or the femurs? Let me know in the chat. So Anshuman for MR, uh, the, the appearance of a chondrosarcoma is T2 hyperintense with this lobulated margins. Okay, so left femur, no, there's no pathology in the left femur. Obliteration of left SI joint, excellent. E1, that's, that's a very good pickup. Left acetabulum, left acetabulum, correct. So the pathology here is in the left supraacetabular region. You see this ill-defined, uh, uh, ill-defined lesion involving the left supraacetabular denominate bone. Uh, like it's it's difficult. Like often this area will have bubble gas, so we may say, oh, there's a uh, over there's an overlying bubble here, so this is likely artifactual. But remember that bubble, despite like however fecal loaded it is, will not obliterate. Uh, uh, the the uh, the denser bone planes, like for example, uh, uh, the look at the bony pelvis, uh, the pelvic ring here. So it's broken here. Uh, that would not happen, uh, dis like uh, if they, if it was if it was due to say an artifact from bubble. So uh, excellent, all of you have picked up uh, the pathology of pages. Uh, Newton pages would have more expansile uh, kind of appearance and fractures in a like a uh, cortical breach in pages are not very common. It causes thickening of the the cortex, which in fact, uh, the chances of prostate, uh, the chances of a fracture are less as compared to normal bone. So I would not give uh, pages as a differential here. Okay, given the history and this aggressive kind of appearance, uh, what would you now think? And uh, another reason for showing the MR of this patient is that uh, just how little we see with radiographs. Uh, so in case if you miss subtle bone findings on radiographs, don't uh, 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 be kind on yourself because it's, it's just the modality, uh, uh, differences in modality that uh, MR just sees so much more than. Excellent. So. Uh, um, given the age of the patient, the first differential would be, and it, because it's a single lesion, the top differential would be metastasis. And uh, given the chronic history patient, this would, could be like it's likely from a lung malignancy. Uh, if there were multiple small lesions, uh, metastatic, metastatic, 
multiple myeloma would be the differential. And finally, lymphoma is another differential, but the history points out towards a primary malignancy. So in an elderly patient, anyone above 40, if you see an aggressive bone lesion, METS, multiple myeloma and lymphoma should be your top differentials, despite whatever the appearance is. Like, say, so for example, you may start thinking, oh, it is uh, uh, it is looking like an ABC, it is looking at something, like, but don't uh, don't go in that, like, don't even think about much about it. Just anything, Above 40, if the lesion looks aggressive, uh, these should be your top differential and the patient will have to have a biopsy. So this was metastasis from a primary uh, lung cancer. This one's a slightly tougher one. So that's why I'm showing you the CT uh, together with the X-ray and uh, I'm giving you some history. Not a very typical location, but uh, the discussion here would be helpful. Uh, and I have a more typical case uh, uh, to show you. And before we move on, we have around 70 people watching us live and we only have nine likes. So uh, go ahead and hit the like button. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything, but it helps the video to read uh, even the live uh, feed. I've seen that uh, uh, once we have uh, more likes and comments, the video reach, <clears throat> the live video reaches more people. So it doesn't hurt you. Uh, it just gives us the motivation to keep on doing this. So let's hit the like button and let's aim at getting the total likes to 100 for this video. Excellent. I was not expecting so many answers, but I'm glad that uh, uh, you were able to diagnose this. When I saw this first case the first time, I was not able to come up with diagnosis. So kudos to all of you. Good job, um, Vidya, Dipali, Rajat, AJ, Upasna, and Sehrish. So uh, what we see here is this uh, calcified lesion involving the posterior buttocks. There are very few differentials for calcifications in this uh, region. Calcific tendonitis is one uh, uh, one differential, but uh, I would expect that uh, to be close to the close to the attachment of the hamstrings, which uh, this is not the case. It's away from, so if you look at the radiograph, so that's the skill tuberosity, that's where the, uh, the hamstrings would attach. So this is far away from that. This is medial to that. So definitely not that. The other Myositis ossificans is a good differential, but again, uh, this is homogeneously calcified. Uh, so again, uh, myositis, myositis ossificans will have, uh, as we discussed previously, peripheral, uh, peripheral dense and central less dense calcification. So again, it'll be very challenging, especially given this location. This was tumoral calcinosis, uh, and this fits with the medical, uh, the, the history that I provided as well. So chronic renal failure patients, for some reason, the etiology is uncertain. They can have these calcific deposits in soft tissues, uh, and that's what is called as, called as tumoral calcinosis. Now, uh, this, these are benign uh, soft tissue calcifications and the more common locations are around joint. So these are periarticular soft tissue calcifications. This is a nice image from a radiographics article and that's the most common typical location centered around the greater trochanter. So this one in the gluteal region is not very common. Uh, uh, it's seen with patients of African uh, American descent and uh, the term, the term tumoral calcinosis, uh, this radiographics article says that it should be uh, it should be restricted to uh, those patients who have hereditary uh, uh, disorders of phosphate uh, uh, metabolism. But because this uh, because this has been used so commonly, uh, even patients with chronic renal failure calcifications, those are also known as tumoral calcifications. So uh, tumoral calcinosis. So, uh, but ideally the term should be restricted to that hereditary subgroup of patients. Uh, the typical imaging appearance is amorphous, cystic, these kind of lobulated appearance, uh, lobulated uh, tumors. And the most important thing is that they don't cause uh, any erosions or uh, they don't, uh, because they are slow growing, they don't affect the adjacent uh, bones um, uh, and soft tissues. So that's a, a characteristic for these. And finally, if you do a CT for these patients, there'll be fluid fluid levels uh, because of sedimentation of the calcium. So calcium being heavy, it settled down, settles down and these are cystic lesions. So that gives rise to this uh, sedimentation sign.
So that we have a, a radiograph of the proximal humerus. And uh, something that we've talked before uh, in your exams, make sure that you write the complete diagnosis. Here, you are attempting, you want to quickly attempt the answer, uh, so it's fine. But in your exams, try to mention the complete diagnosis. Like, say, for example, in this patient, I would say this is a left left humeral diaphyseal, whatever, X, Y, Z, whatever the diagnosis is here. Okay, so bone and fuck. So that's one uh, diagnosis that I was expecting. Uh, that's a differential here for sure. What's the other differential? When you, whenever you say bone and fart, what the other uh, differential that uh, has a similar appearance, this kind of uh, calcific appearance with lobulated serpiginous border. So that's the uh, the buzzword that uh, the, the examiner is looking for. So calcified uh, lesion with these serpiginous border. And chondroma, excellent. So uh, Manish, uh, uh, I, I see this mistake again commonly. I don't know why. Uh, we often call humerus the femur, the femur, the humerus. So make sure you don't come with this mixing. So you said left femoral. So this is not femur. This is humerus. So this is a left humeral lesion. Uh, and chondroma is a good differential. So chondroma and medullary uh, uh, a bone infarct, those are top differentials for this. I have the MR for this patient. And let's see if we can distinguish in between these two or this is this something totally different. So uh, on MR, we have this T2 hyperintense appearance. Um, remember chondroid tumors, that they, they typically have this, uh, remember that chondrosarcoma image that I showed you, that T2 bright appearance is very, very characteristic of uh, chondrosarcomas. So that's one thing that helps you, chondromas, chondroid tumors, sorry. So that's one thing that will help you distinguish. The other thing is, uh, Look at the tumor. Uh, look at the tumor itself. In the region of the tumor, I don't see any normal medullary fat. When there is a bone infarct, there'll be some portions of the bone that are uh, they don't infarct. Only the like you'll see central uh, normal bone marrow that's preserved. There are a few areas of preserved marrow here, but this is outside the tumor. This, if you see areas of preserved marrow within uh, the lesion on T1, uh, I would put bone infarcts uh, higher than enchondroma. So enchondroma would be the differential, the, the better differential here. Uh, the T2 appearance is also very, this is not typical for bone and fart. Now that's what I thought when I first got this set from Dr. Raj, uh, Dr. Bochu, that's uh, he's submitted this case. So thank you, Dr. Bochu for submitting uh, these wonderful cases. If you want to read more MSK radiology cases, you can check out his website, MSK radiology for you. Uh, it's an excellent uh, uh, resource. I think he has more than 3,500 bone tumor cases. So you can check out that website. So when he sent me this case, I was like, yeah, this is an enchondroma. And that's what I thought. But uh, this is a recent uh, uh, entity and we should be aware of this. Enchondromas are usually small tumor, usually less than two centimeter. So if you see a chondroid lesion more than five, 10 centimeter, you should not call it enchondroma. The term used for that is atypical cartilaginous tumor. Uh, so, uh, and the reason for that, these are low grade osteos, uh, low grade chondrosarcomas. Uh, the other features that will help you distinguish from a benign enchondroma uh, from an low grade osteosarcoma or atypical cartilaginous tumor is uh, cortical uh, remodeling and uh, deep endosteal scalloping. And enchondromas themselves can cause endosteal scalloping. So uh, this is the cortex of the tumor. This is the medulla, best appreciated on T1 uh, because medulla has fat. Uh, mm, even enchondromas, if they grow large enough, they can cause uh, scalloping of the cortex here. That's what is end osteal scalloping. Now, uh, hence the term reserved for uh, the the uh, fat, uh, the feature reserved for low grade osteosarcomas is deep end osteal sc scalloping. Uh, oh, and both of these can be difficult, uh, endosteal scalloping and cortical remodeling, but the, 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 the feature that is easy is the length of the tumor. So anything more than two centimeters, uh, especially if you see something this long, uh, the, the differential would be atypical cartilaginous tumor and not enchondroma. So 
very it's a very uh, it's a recent entity that's why uh, i had never heard of it when i was doing my trading uh, so that's why even i thought this was an enchondroma and those are the distinguishing features uh, uh, size more than 5 cm cortical remodeling deep scalloping location involving the proximal metaphysis and uh, if you do a dynamic mr uh, there'll be early enhancement i think this is the last case for today Again, what's the age of the patient? Let's start with that. Thank you, Gopal, for uh, putting up that website. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Bochu, Bochu is the main author, and there are other contributors from Birmingham, Birmingham Hospital, UK. Again, okay, agreed, Ivan. So this is an immature skeleton, so a younger patient. So uh, we should think of tumors that affect the tumors or conditions that can affect the younger patients. Now let, let's try to see if it's an aggressive or a non-aggressive lesion. Let's try to localize the lesion first. So where is the lesion? Is it in the proximal femur, the proximal tibia, or the proximal fibula? Ivan says per permis permissive permeative, I, I think you've been permeative. So permeative lesion around the distal femur. Distal femur, correct. So the lesion is in the distal femur. Um, how is the zone of transition? Is it narrow? Is it wide? Are you able to distinguish normal and abnormal bone? So is it an aggressive or a non-aggressive lesion? Okay, so Nugen, Dr. Nugen, that's right. The zone of transition is wide. And Anshuman, yes, this is an aggressive lesion. The next step after that is look at the matrix. Do you see any kind of matrix here? Uh, uh, compare it with the normal tibia and fibula here. How is the matrix? Is it calcified? Is it not calcified? Distal femur fibrous dysplasia. Uh, we'll discuss that. So uh, aggressive lesion. Yes, we, we, we've decided this is an aggressive lesion involving the distal femur. Look at the matrix. Is it osteoid matrix? Is it do you see ring and arc of calcification? No, we don't see that ring and arc type of calcification. Definitely not that. Is there, uh, is it, uh, is it normal? Is the matrix similar to the remaining bone? No. Is it sclerotic or osteoid matrix? So it is an osteoid matrix. Osteomyelitis is a great differential for uh, this location. So metaphyseal um, metaphysis in the uh, pediatric population, what happens is that there is this hairpin bend of vessels at the metaphysis. So there's st uh, stasis of uh, blood uh, at the metaphysis. So that's why infections are more commonly seen around the metaphysis in children. Uh, now, the, the other things that you look for bone tumors are cortical breach. So let's look at the cortex and try to trace it. So yeah, the cortex looks okay. Uh, I don't see a fracture there. Then look at the periosteal reaction. Is there a periosteal reaction in this patient? It's subtle, but um, yeah, unfortunately, I can't zoom in here. Okay, no breach, that's for sure. But look at this uh, upper margin of the lesion. There is this periosteal reaction and the periosteum looks like it's lifted from the periosteum. So what periosteal reaction do we call that? So when the periosteum is lifted uh, in a triangular fashion, what do we call that? Christina, yes, that's correct. So Codman triangle uh, is the periosteal reaction. Again, uh, although certain periosteal reactions have been described for certain tumors, they are not very specific. So all it says is that it's an aggressive tumor based on the periosteal reaction. But putting that uh, with the osteoid uh, matrix, uh, we can say we can say that this is an osteogenic sarcoma. So excellent, all of you, we've gradually, uh, so the, the point of repeating this case uh, in the end was, I was trying to uh, get you into the search pattern for a bone tumor. So we started off uh, localizing, uh, First step, not even localizing the tumor. First step is we age the patient. Then we localize the lesion, try to see if it's aggressive or non-aggressive, and then try to find um, which area is it affecting. Is it epiphysis, metaphysis, diaphysis? And then uh, we, we see other features such as cortical breach, periosteal reaction. And then uh, obviously based on this, 
nobody's going to stop here. They're going to do an MR. That's what we did for this patient. Now, you, there's some periosteal reaction on the other, the, the medial aspect as well. Subtle, but it is definitely seen on radiographs. But look at the MR. Look how little we see on uh, radiographs. So there's this patient has bilateral periosteal uh, reaction in the form of cordman strangle. There's an aggressive osteoid lesion. So the final uh, diagnosis is uh, an osteogenic sarcoma infection uh, would not have this kind of florid uh, periosteal reaction. So based on the MR appearance, that would go uh, lower down. Um, so yeah, so all of you, I'm glad that all of you participated in this uh, with me for the step-by-step -step diagnosis. And then if you look, if you if you have this kind of search pattern, uh, bone tumors would be very easy for you. So hopefully you learned a few new things and consolidated uh, whatever you knew. And this is a quick repack, uh, recap. We saw a giant cell tumor involving the proximal tibia. We talked about uh, how these are subarticular sub and eccentric lesions. Remember, epiphyseal tumor uh, in a pediatric patient, chondroblastoma, in an adult patient will be GCT. Ewing sarcoma, a bone tumor with uh, more like the soft tissue component is far more than the bone tumor itself, the bone component itself. Aneurysmal bone tumor, only bone tumor uh, who's, which is named after its radiological appearance. Uh, osteogenic sarcomas, we discussed a couple of cases. Parosteal sarcoma, uh, commonly seen along the distal femur posteriorly, you'll see a cleavage sign only in 30% of cases though. Periosteal uh, osteogenic sarcomas will be circumferential and will affect the diaphysis. Chondrosarcomas, that lobulated appearance on MR with T2 hyperintensity, very characteristic of chondroid matrix. And on X-ray, there'll be ring in our type of calcification. Metastasis, anybody older than 40 years, aggressive lesion, Mets myeloma lymphoma, period. Tumoral calcinosis, usually periarticular, commonly seen in patients with chronic renal failure. And uh, you may see sedimentation on CT because of uh, uh, the, the calcium settling down. Any enchondroma like appearing lesion more than two centimeters, think about atypical cartilaginous tumors, also known as low grade chondrosarcomas. And finally, another case of osteogenic sarcomas. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining me live. And for those who are watching later, hope you find this useful. And if you aren't aware, check out our uh, extensive case collection on Radiogam. We have more than 700 cases now, uh, such aren't many cases. This was set number 31. And now we have 31 video descriptions, so 300 plus cases have detailed video descriptions like these. So these will help you prepare for your radiology board exams and even in your clinical practice. Thank you once again for joining me live. And do let me know your feedback in the comments uh, below. Uh, and we, we try to inculcate uh, uh, each of those feedback. So last time somebody mentioned that our uh, smaller radiographs, see the foot are uh, maybe difficult to pick up on um, on smaller screens. So we're going to implement that. We're going to try to have larger and magnified images for these. So uh, do make sure that you comment below your feedback and we try to work on uh, everything that you suggest. Thank you guys. And I shall see you guys in our next video. Bye-bye.